Um, thank you very much for, for coming and thanks to Zani and everybody who made this conference possible. I want to make just a few points, uh, largely on the basis of the research that the International State Crime, of which I'm director, has um, conducted and with my colleagues Thomas McManus and Alicia Delacour Venning. I think I want to start with the, this question of the naming of genocide. Earlier this morning we heard that, that now it's generally accepted that, that what's happening to the Rohingya is incontrovertibly a genocide. Now, this naming comes very late in the day. In fact, it comes too late. And whilst we are glad that, that, that our efforts have been um, acknowledged in this way, uh, it is too late for early intervention. And that's what... And unfortunately, I think that this late recognition of what the persecution of the, of the Rohingya as being genocide comes out of a fundamental misunderstanding of what genocide is. And that misunderstanding is that genocide is an event, some form of spectacularised mass killing. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. But because from August 25th, we saw the, the, the flight of around 800,000 Rohingya, the, the murder of around, well, we possibly between 20 and 25,000 Rohingya, the mass rapes of Rohingya women and the, the, the violent destruction of communities and villages and, and everything that is significant to making Rohingya community life real. Um, because that happened post August 25th, uh, I think the world has woken up, then it looks like a genocide. But actually, this genocide has been very slow in the making. It's at least 30 years old. And I think it's very important, uh, and I think certainly the work of Zani um, and uh, Natalie Brinham and our work at the International State Crime Initiative has been to demonstrate that genocide is a process. And why I said that it's the, the naming of genocide has come too late, it's come too late for certain forms of intervention. We know that states are extremely unwilling to call genocide by its name because it obliges them to act. It obliges them to intervene, to prevent and to punish. Now, the possibility of punishment exists. I'm not a huge fan of the ICC and that route. Uh, we might see some action 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Um, but I think that the, the point about recognising genocide as a process means that we can intervene in a whole, in a myriad of ways much earlier on in the process. And we had plenty of warning. We had plenty of warning in relation to this genocide. Um, in 2015, um, at ISCI, we published Countdown to Annihilation, which you can find if you simply Google it. It's on our website. Um, we published this report. And we, we used a framework that has been uh, obviously drawing very closely on Raphael Lemkin's work, but quite specifically on the work of Daniel Feirstein, that genocide is a process which encompasses effectively six stages or phases. The first is uh, processes of stigmatisation and dehumanisation. That then leads into a form of harassment, which includes sporadic violence against the target group. It also means the removal of civil rights. Um, that harassment turns into uh, significant violence, as we saw in 2012 in Sitwe, where uh, Rohingya homes were razed to the ground and all Rohingya from Sitwe were forced into what is a detention or concentration camp complex. That's the physical isolation stage uh, of, of genocide. And once people have been physically and socially isolated in this way, so in, as, as those of you who know the situation of the Rohingya well, you'll know there are around 40 camps <coughs> in around Sitwe and Marau U, um, where, and I think it is right to call them concentration camps, um, where people are, about 140,000 Rohingya live squalid, uh, existences, uh, where they are denied access to health care, where they are denied adequate food, where they are denied opportunity for engaging in livelihood practices, where their communities have been utterly fragmented, where they are, all their movement is restricted, and they are leading what um, Giorgio Agamben would call bare lives. And I think that the Claudia Card, a, a sort of a theorist of, of genocide, talks about social death. And when you walk into those camps, that's what you feel, that this is social death. 
Um, and so when we did our research in uh, Myanmar, in the camps in 2014-15, we determined that the Rohingya were certainly uh, experiencing the process of genocide and they were at the stage of systematic weakening. And they were being weakened by all the forces I've just mentioned. Um, and that was really very, very clear. And interventions might have taken place at that point. Um, but they didn't. Then we went back. I mean, we published our report, and then we went back uh, to, to well, we went to, to Bangladesh uh, in October, November, and we interviewed uh, around 70 uh, people, survivors of the genocide, in the camps. Um, now, what I didn't mention was that there are two final phases of genocide, according to Fierstein, and and they are reflected in in Lemkin's. Uh, analysis of genocide. Lemkin talks about the, the genocide taking place in two phases. The first is the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group, in this case the Rohingya, and the second phase is the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. Uh, and that's what we are seeing now. Uh, from October 25th, from, I'm sorry, from August 25th uh, last year, we saw the mass annihilation um, of the Rohingya uh, in the sense, and as Lemkin made very clear, annihilation doesn't necessarily mean mass killing at all. You can eliminate a population through a whole range of means uh, and, and every means has been uh, exerted against the Rohingya. But what we're now seeing, if you like, is that final stage of genocide. Um, so when we can talk about, in some senses, the genocide being over, we must also say the genocide continues because what's happening inside Rakhine State now is symbolic enactment. That's Fierstein's term. But what we're seeing is, if you like, the reconstruction of the old society and the new society, which the Myanmar sta state is constructing, is one in which the Rohingya are wholly absent and were always absent. And we know, I mean, we heard earlier that the identity um, of the Rohingya has not been acknowledged by the Myanmar state. But there are various um, strategies that the state is currently employing to make sure that the society that is being built is one in which the Rohingya were never present, which is what makes the prospect of repatriation so terrifying, I think. Uh, at, at this particular point. Now, I, don't, I suspect I don't have very much more time or any time. 